we're going to wrap up this conference with, with a keynote, which is uh, uh, fantastic. Um, the keynote will be by Marlene, Marlene Stick, who we already see here. Um, and she's the founder and managing director of Waag Society, or the Waag Future Lab in Amsterdam. Uh, and if you read the website, there's this really, really nice sentence. It says, Waag Future Lab reinforces critical reflection on technology, develops technological and social design skills, and encourages social innovation, and even better, these words keeps on coming. Marlene leads the transdisciplinary team of designers, artists, and scientists using public research and key enabling methodologies to empower people to participate in the collective design of open, fair, and inclusive futures. No, 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 no. So, so these are... Um, no, 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 that's not my point. So always, I, I love these kind of words. I could have written them myself. But what do they mean, right? What do they mean? And one of the reasons why I, I really admire Marlene's work is her capability to make, to make these great theoretical concepts really concrete, and actually she gets them to work. She gets them, well, you, you don't only make them think, but you really do something with it. And let me give you two examples. First, Marlene was the founder and the major of the Digitale Stad, the Digital City. There's already mentioned Wednesday, this morning at a speech, uh, and you'll hear more about it uh, the, in, in, her, in her keynote. And the Digital City, the first virtual community introducing fee, free public access to the internet, founded in 1993. And you might have seen Marlene already in her younger years in the presentation of, of Charda last Wednesday. And another fantastic example uh, is this thing that I always have with me. It's this phone. It's, it's the Fairphone. Um, you, you already also had it, right? So the Fairphone, um, it's the first fair smartphone in the world uh, that was produced at Waag. And it's fair in all sorts of manners, so that the parts are produced in a fair manner. But the most exciting part, what I like about, about the phone, is that it's about all about uh, all sorts of components that you can get out of each other, and you can replace them. So actually, yesterday I replaced my screen. I dropped it for the third time. Um, and this is a fantastic new way um, where you see how you can open up your technology and make it, uh, make it sustainable. And that's actually where Marlene's motto also links to. If you can't open it, you don't own it. If you can't open it, you don't own it. And thus, he's continually working on all sorts of these kind of projects to open up the digital world. And though I like critical thinkers, I especially like critical thinkers that are not only pessimistic, but really try to come up with solutions. That's why I also love Marlene's book. I brought it with me. Fantastic title, The Internet is Broken. Sorry, guys. But we can fix it. And let's fix it. That's, that's, that's one of the essence that I, that's I really like. And fixing is necessary. And that's why I invite you all to let yourself be indulged by the inspiration of the world. Of Marlene. A big hand of applause for Marlene. Yes, thank you so much. That's really nice. And I realize I have to maybe make our long introduction of what we do and our mission a little bit shorter. But still, the, the, all this, and I think what you said is really nice that the things that we say we actually do. So it's not just uh, beautiful language, it's really our practice. Uh, and we are situated uh, at the center of Amsterdam in an old uh, city gate, De Waag. So whenever you are near, please join us or let me know. We can show you around. Uh, I want to talk with you about public values in the digital domain. Uh, as something which should be at the, at the core and not just as an add-on or a nice to have. Uh, and what I will do, I will sort of present to you, I will go into a little bit into the digital city, but I think Charla de Haan, who is here, uh, did an enormous job to, to preserve the digital city and to reenact the digital city. So it's really web archaeology that helped us to, uh, to have a piece of this digital city. I will tell you a bit more about that. Uh, but I will also go into this, how to design them with public values and how to access, for example, how do we deal with things like uh, gener generative AI that, we, that now had the chat GPT stuff that's happening at the moment, but also maybe the tooling that you, that you use or create yourself. So it, it is also sort of reflecting on the practice of anybody dealing with digital tools and how we can uh, change the way that we develop them. So the untold story about how the internet became social and why this matters for its future. If we can't tell people where it comes from and we don't have proof for that, 
the, the, the language, the, the storylines will change. So for, for, this is the dominant. So we now, this was the, sort of the promise. This was how we started with the internet as a green land, a commons, a place where we could sort of create things that we wanted to create. This was the open space that I felt was there in 1992, 93, when we envisioned the digital city. This is how it is now. It's 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 not a green field anymore. It's it's a lot of people don't feel it as as an open space anymore. It's it's defined by uh, the big tech companies and their business models and their surveillance capitalists. Although, which is I've, I love this this picture because of course of the panopticum, which is how we feel that we are being watched and being uh, also manipulated by feeling being watched. But this panopticum is also already a little bit um, in decline, which is nice because we got sort of some, some sort of legislation now with GDPR and the Digital Service Act and the Market Act and the AR Act, which comes from Europe. There are some actions uh, from, from lawsuits against big tech. So it's not the surveillance capitalist model that's dominant always. There are some interactions with um, public values. Um, but this is a dominant story. This dominant story is the internet has military origins, the ARPANET, so this is how people tell, so it's not, it's coming from the military, so be happy that there is something civic here, because originally it was mil mil uh, military. Uh, the internet becomes uh, became social around 2004 because of the, uh, the successful entrepreneurs, they, they like, go fast and break stuff uh, like um, and and the, and the, the term was then coined in 2004 web 2.0 um, and it has been used before but that was the big conference of O'Reilly the web 2.0 revolution the user generated content started in 2004 because of the platforms because of uh, YouTube myspace Facebook they were all started around 2004 2005. And then, of course, the internet is free. Be happy; it's it's free, so don't don't uh, make any complaints. Um, uh, the, and 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 therefore, the platforms own you. So yeah, you have to have an exchange. It's free, so and just just take so privacy is that. It's just like that. The internet, it, the internet, it is the internet. The internet is owned by platforms. Uh, it's free, so you will have to give up your privacy. That is the way. There is no other way. That's a little bit how it's being brought to people. And most people experience it this as, as the story. But the other story of the internet is that uh, the internet is a network of networks. So uh, middle, in, the midi, in the middle of the 80s, there were many different types of computer networks. For example, the NGO networks, Interdoc, uh, Antenna Network, PCNet, HIFNet, Agreenet. These were all computer networks with story forward email connections that would go deep into Africa, deep into to South America, also in, 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 in the US and, and, and Europe and so forth. And by saying that the ARPAN, that, that the internet is from deriving from ARPANET and military, we really forget the social roots of it because many people are already using it for social movements. Uh, and that was a very active group of uh, computer scientists, but also people coming from social backgrounds and artists and hackers. Uh, bulletin board systems was very was like the amateur environment. A lot of people started their own bulletin board uh, and connected them to other bulletin boards. So uh, user-generated content uh, was there from the beginning. You could say it started to, when I entered, the, when I started to use uh, the, the internet in 91, 92, there were already bloggers. Mom Kat was one of the first bloggers. So it was already a blogosphere. That, that didn't happen only when a big company offered this opportunity. It was already there. Um, and, uh, and of course, the digital city in itself shows that already in 94, there was a social media platform. Not just when MySpace or Facebook started in 2005, 10 years later. Or, or, uh, or you know, for, for um, I think, MySpace. Um, and then, um, you, as I said, the, the internet was more a commons, a space which had open protocols, uh, open uh, way you could add, you could connect to the, to the internet without having to need permission like the telcos normally had as their model. So, um, it, we, we just didn't look after it. So it was a compass, but we that got then big tech got it in their hands, and they they very well argued that governments should stay away. So please stay away with all this kind of governments don't know how to innovate. They're slow, 
let's let's move fast and break things. Well, how did they? They did, really did some breaking here. So this is the social roots. I just give some names. Um, some of them are conferences go back to 1998, uh, like the um, the Galactic Hacker Party or the Zero Positive Ball. The, 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 Already at that moment, people formulated what are the benefits of computer networks and what are also the fears for them when they would be in the wrong hands. So nobody there was ignorant or naive about what could happen with the internet. Um, the People's Communication Charter already formulated digital, uh, uh, like the rights, human rights in the digital domain. So this all already is there. And then we have all these, these conferences, the next five minutes, technical media, but also, as I said, Interdoc, APC, Antenna Network, Hectic, well, Casos Computer Club. These are all starting in the 80s, free software movement starting in, in the 80s. Um, and actually, that I can tell you this is because we archive some of it. So thank you for that. It is your role to have that we can tell this kind of stories. If you don't have it, if you don't have the proof, it's very difficult. To, to make other narratives, to, to tell other stories. And why I think it's important to, to show that there are different, uh, different ways of origins of, of the internet is also to counter the position that we owe it all to the platforms and to the big tech, that we should be, be happy with it and just stay calm because the public is just like a consumer and not an active contributor to the development of technology. Um, there's more and more interest, as it's really nice. So I think the book, the modern world, over uh, the prehistoric, no, this is a prehistoric of social media, uh, describes it really well. It's a lot also about the bulletin board uh, uh, movement, and hacking Europe is also talk, uh, is a very nice book which describes how Europe, the role of, Euro of Europe in this whole making of the internet, because normally it's said as it's one of the narratives is the U.S. based. It comes from the U.S. Europe only contributed with the World Wide Web, which is, of course, is not true. But again, we need to, ha to have to show what all these networks and all these initiatives did. And I'm really, I just would be interested, is anybody of you doing some work on the 80s and the 90s? There, one, more, no, one. I... <laughs> so it would be, it would be really good if we, if we dig deeper into what is there on, on computer cultures and internet cultures before we start to to uh, be, even before the internet archive, which is uh, already very it's great that the internet archive started somewhere in '93. Uh, uh, luckily, they did, but um, there's more. So initiatives as like Hectic here in the Netherlands has been very important, like the Chaos Computer Club in, in Germany, 2600 uh, Hackers magazine um, in New York, uh, Hacking at the End of the Universe as a conference where all these people came together and discussed the future of the internet and how we could use it and how we could develop it. Next five minutes, uh, the, the, the Galactic Hacker Party. There's also some print and some material, so it's always nice, not just the digital. There's also some context to, 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 to bring together books that have been written. And I think this is a very interesting uh, um, version of a uh, text of uh, Manuel Castells. He wrote this trilogy on the network cultures. And then he says, um, in 1984, something emerges and he calls it a new form of public sphere. And he says, this is, this is the digital city. It's something new, it's something arrives from all this, this collaboration between social movements, uh, designers, hackers, and so on. And this has been described also in the Hacking Europe uh, uh, book. So, January 19, 1994, January 15, is the moment that we opened the digital city. So, some of you maybe have had some images already from uh, Charda, but uh, let's start. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. And now I have to wait. <laughs> and this is the waiting. This, this was actually fast. <laughs> 40k4, I think, 9600 about. Um, so it started as a, as a text-based city. Um, there was something like Freenet software already in the uh, in place. We sort of used that and change and and then sort of sort of designed it in our way. 
Um, but then very shortly after that, uh, because this was, of course, uh, the World Wide Web mosaic as a web browser was somewhere there in 1993, but it was not really distributed and most of the, the computers couldn't really handle it. So our public, uh, public um, uh, terminals were VT100 screens, which were really only text-based. So it was like this beginning that you would, can, would have uh, even images on your screen, uh, although Amiga, um, anyway. Um, but really, a few few months later, it was immediately DDS 3.0. This is then the full version with uh, squares, with house areas where people could build their houses, with uh, places to go outside, with um, um, profile pages, with uh, chat chat environments, with well, almost everything you can... I think everything we now have was already there. Even smart TV, which was what we now call the second screen, the combination of live TV and chat, IRC at that moment, was already there, 1994. I think, so, this, so the idea of what kind of applications you could make, what kind of environments you would create, this whole idea about profiling, uh, having your own space, creating web, web pages, your own projects, it all started uh, very early and has had a lot of influence, of course, uh, with this. A digital city Vienna um, in in Berlin in other countries as well. So this was a whole collaboration as well within uh, in the, on the internet with all, all kind of people around the world starting to do these kind of things. These are all the different squares. But even as concept of how do we going to remember people, Momento Mori was already there. Like so, a lot of people immediately it it fuels the creativity and the conceptual development of it. So you could say that most, almost all the concepts that we now still use in, 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 our, in our social media sphere have been developed in the early ages already. Um, these are all kind of home pages and also uh, uh, software generated uh, avatars. So everybody who would be uh, an, an inwoner, say, a citizen of the digital city, got its own generated image, a dodo, um, and, and, and actually, we, re, we, we find back the software, which is what I'm going to tell you. Because oh yeah, this is then this was also there a metro, a, a, a Dungeons and Dragons, a mud and moose, sorry, uh, object oriented, a moo, that, which was also part of the digital city, a game environment, text text based game environment. And luckily, we have we found back the hardware. And in 1996, we made a freeze. So we def at that moment we realized that we had something special in our hands because this was not just a set of web pages, this was a whole functional system of interaction and of, of a community of people that were sharing information and building up new concepts and ideas. Um, so we have this the hardware, but we also have the software and freeze. We also have some other stuff like the, uh, magazines, uh, and here we have an image of the VT100 uh, uh, public terminal, uh, which we had in five places in in, in the city. Um, the, then I can tell you this story is of course because in an early stage we realized that we had to make a freeze, so we we, we made a, a copy of everything that we had at that moment, including all the versions of the digital city. And that became later, a, of course, an enormous problem for the people that wanted to reenact the digital city. Because, uh, but we have, and, and but that happened. So, students from the University of Amsterdam, together with uh, Geert Alberts, uh, who was the professor there, they worked together, and we now have, um, we have a captured. You can time travel to 1996. Uh, not just an in, in, in internet archive type of internet, but really a full set of uh, coherent, integrated web part, part of the internet from 1996. And uh, hopefully, we will, there will be a discussion, but it has been uh, presented by the Dutch UNESCO committee for, to be, become one of the first um, world heritage, um, on the world heritage list. We will, we will hear coming weeks if that's going to happen. And then that, and of course, it's quite interesting that things like this are becoming really a reference to for people to understand what happened over the years. So, based on that, we have this part of the history that we that there is some oral history about what happened in the 80s. That some scholars and and researchers have done work in 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 revealing the stories and and the people that are still some of them are still alive. It's very strange for myself to be. 
cultural heritage. It, it, it feels really it is a very short time. But most of the people that are, were there in the 80s and 90s are still there. So it's very interesting to interview them and ask them. Uh, just, just to give you a hint, Twitter uh, ha derives from social movements. It's very difficult to understand that now. But it comes from uh, in, the, in the media, which was a social media group, um, uh, activist group. Um, so if you dig into something like that, you will find another story, which is very interesting. Now, of course, Twitter is, is, is gone if, from this idea of social movements. But it, it originates from social movements, from protest movements. Um, and again, I think it's in, important to have to, to, that we are able to tell these stories, and it's, it's your profession to help to, to tell these stories, and I think it's very important. So the recapitulation is this, that the internet origins from public investment in research and development. We always forget that most, even ARPANET was publicly funded, so this, this is public funding. Uh, and from social movements, a culture of commons and consensus. This is the starting point. This was the greenfield. It started as an environment by, for scientific research and societal exploration by artists, designers, hackers, and social movements. And at the beginning of the 21st century, companies take over. Platform capitalism becomes dominant with a culture of appropriation extraction. So it doesn't have to be like that, but it happens because we didn't take care of the public values on, in the public domain. We could have known this because in 95, already the whole, the, this, the, 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 uh, Andy Cameron uh, already uh, defi uh, uh, defined the term Californian ideology. So if, if we critique, at the moment, if you critique the Silicon Valley, we think it's, it's, it's critique that comes from maybe some t 10 years ago, critiquing Silicon Valley. But it was already in 1905. It was already, people knew already what was happening there. So it's very interesting to read this document from the California ideology from um, Richard Barbrook and, C and Cameron. In 96, a year later, we have something that is referred to again and again. It's the, in, the, the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, which is, which is of course, uh, exactly what Cameron and, uh, and uh, already defined as this is an ideology. This is the, the, the ideology of the of, of the independence declaration of independence of cyberspace was government stay away, get get out of our way. This is something you can't govern this. So it, it's it's a very pompostic, very strange text uh, from John Perry Barlow, um, and that became. So you see that this debate about more the European version, like there is no such thing as as power. Power is always in networks. Technology is always an, an expression of power. It's not neutral. And then the story of the Silicon Valley that tries to convince us that we should not think about old school democratic principles, laws, and so on, because the market will give us freedom. So, okay, how can we fix this? So we are now now. So we are in the present, and we want to have a clear vision on how to act. Um, and that, I think this this picture could help us a lot. So we, you could say we this this what we understand from from the internet is mostly the application layer. Most people interact with the applications on your telephone or on your on your desktop. Um, and almost all of the applications that you use at the moment, when underneath the surface, it's closed black box, big tech is in control, extraction of value, well, the, the whole the whole shabam, the things that we feel uncomfortable with. So where do we want to go? for applications in the future, is that they are open and public. Interoperability, of course, is very important. Society in control, regenerative, so no extractive, no, no, um, um, and data minimalization, and fair and sustainable. So, so this is a vision. For, well, let's, let's think that we can do this, that we can, if we make the right decisions, we can come back to something which is public values in the digital domain, which we then could call sort of a public stack, Technology almost was seen as a stack of te technologies, like the hardware, the infrastructure, the application layer, the protocols, they're all intertwined. But you can also define them. So like the, the Fairphone you just mentioned, it's, it's open hardware, so you can repair it. So it is a different type of phone in, in that sense than the normal phones that we have. But also the operating system, you can you choose yourself which operating system you put on this device, which is different from most of the phones which comes with it operating system. You have also the framework computer, which is the same for computers, which uh, are really beautiful computers, and you also can repair them. 
So that movement to, to with public values, public stack defined, it really happen, it's already happening, it's already in the, in the making. And if you abstract from that, you can look at this, you can see like, uh, the, if you think about this, this iceberg, then the top of the layer is the application layer. Underneath that is this technical, the technical stack. Um, something that we normally don't discuss or we don't have a lot of language for even because we, we have outsourced it to the, to the techies. But I think if you think about protocols, you understand that protocols can include or exclude people. Uh, open source or closed source defines who can use it or not use it. Or, or so the, this kind of principles are in this stack. These technologies are all designed. So there is a design process which which is being defined, and how does the design process looks like? How, who, is, who is part of it? And even more Im important, and that's where I think it all starts, what, what, are, what is the foundation? What are the assumptions? So um, if you look at the, the stack, then the first questions that you have to, before you start to make anything, even also the tools that you use yourself or you start to help to develop, uh, of, the two, of the make the decisions, what kind of software you're going to have for in procurement, what kind of software are we going to use in education, for example, are we going to work with the big tech companies, or are we going to define the values first and then make decisions upon that? Um, so one of the first is assumptions. What are you optimizing for? What kind of problem are you solving? And who defines that? Technology is not neutral. Technology is always man-made or woman-made, most, not always, but let's say one of the problems, not, it's not really diverse, the, 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 the people that are in, in tech at the moment. Um, but people are, we are fundamentally biased, so we, so we bring our culture and our ideas about how the world should be in the technology. So by acknowledging that, we can make it to clarify it, to be open about the discussion. A second question is, um, what are, how are we going to deal with the human rights, with the, with the fundamental rights? Are you going to ignore them or are you going to use, use them as, for example, privacy by design? Is it a principle that we're going to choose for or are we ignoring it? Ignoring it? All really stuff that you should make, decisions that you can make. This, these are not neutral decisions. These are very explicit uh, 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 decisions. Uh, who owns it? Social, economic, the, 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 the models. Um, is it big tech that owns it? If, if we have, for example, now with artificial intelligence, we created all the content, we as humanity created all the content is now being appropriated by a few big tech players that, that, that swallow all the cultural content, all the databases, all the websites. And then they define the price under which you can use JetGPT or BART or any other of the AIs that are now in, in the, make, gen, the generative AI that is in the making. Doesn't sound as a good idea for us. Like, how, how, why, why can they appropriate all our... If, if, I'm not sure how many databases and content you're, you're responsible for. Uh, our website is already being swallowed by BART, I think. And, and we have a Creative Commons license, so they're against our principles. They can't just take our comment. They can't take our content. Are we? Can we start a lawsuit on ourselves, or should we collectively operate? Should we, as a cultural sector, as a scientific sector, start some lawsuits against these companies that are taking it for granted that they can just take this content and make it their own business model? And the other one is the governance. Can we already define the governance in the system that we are developing? Is there any public oversight? Is, is, and do we take that into the process itself? Yeah, from that, it, it becomes a design process. So, and again, for design processes, there are very good methodologies to make that more diverse, more, uh, more integrated, have more, more voices there, have more people involved in this. Um, so again, if we think that technology is a, a man-made, then we have to make the process of making technology also inclusive and diverse, and not just at the end as something that we have a, that we want to add later. We have to do it in the whole process. So um, that involved. Then, of course, this will uh, give a lot of. If you design differently, you will have another application. You have another technology stack. Uh, for example, uh, if you think about. You want to have ownership by the people. You want to have, not, no, you want you don't want to have any dependency on big tech. Then you will come up with Fediverse, which is Mastodon has a different working, has a different protocol, is differently designed than a Twitter. 
So you, you really can make alternatives. Peertube is different than YouTube. So you, you, because it works differently, the principles are different because the values that are go into this design are different. So if, uh, luckily we see that this is in, in the making. So Fediverse for Federative Internet is uh, something that has, is very hopeful. There's a lot to, that, that, and I think at the moment, especially for archiving, I would put my money on the Fediverse because all the other platforms are closed. So you, you're, you're too, we are too late to, 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 uh, to map Twitter because they close the doors. But the Fediverse, uh, Mastodon, but also Peertube, that is a development that you can contribute to as, as professionals as well, as researchers. Uh, and it is really needed. We need this kind of collaborations between all these different professions and, and, and people that have knowledge about this. Um, so just as an as example, we have Waag Social as a... As a is one of the Mastodon instances. And a lot of uh, scientific or, or, or um, universities have now their own instances. And I'm not sure if that's all over the world, but I think it's quite, there are 10 million users, which is really much less than, than any other social media platform. But it's also, where do you invest in? Where do you put your time in? And I think this, this can be really very, uh, and I try to, be, to have this feeling that we can fix it, although I really understand what the forces are that we are against. Uh, these forces are huge, especially at the moment around AI and the investment there. So, But then, again, I think people that are working in the public sphere, having public uh, responsibilities, can collaborate and build up a strength that we now, at the moment, not, not use enough. So in the end, then that will, of course, deal. Then we will have other applications. We will have another environment that people can choose from. Um, we, we also call this public spaces or the public domain or the digital public domain. So the whole term digital public domain is something that we have to work on and we have to start to, to collaborate on. So what about generative AI? I already mentioned it. Um, people are on strike now. This, this, this is a moment that people have to strike because their work is being taken away from them. Uh, they will be belittled, they will be taken out, out of the equation because uh, for companies it's easier to, uh, to use JetGPT or other versions of generative AI. But very important to, to always define what kind of AI you mean because there's a whole mystification about AI. And if somebody says don't be afraid for AI, it's because of the mystification. There is no consciousness in AI. It's, it's, it's just statistics. There's no, there's no man in machine. So let's let's not let, let's not go for that kind of kind of mystification, like the, the, because that's very dangerous. If we start to believe that kind of stories, we we're, we're lost. There's no there's no consciousness, no sentience in in AI. But there is a lot of the, we have to be wor we have to worry a lot because it's in the hand of companies that are not uh, optimizing for our welfare. They're optimizing for their shareholders. This is the, this is the problem now, not not in the future, not with post-human sort of uh, dystopian futures. It, it's it, in the now. We really have to act. And you see, at the moment, a lot of the unions are taking st a step up against this kind of technologies. And what is nice, uh, they have, I have this quote from the New York Times, actually uh, from last day, where the Luddites are sort of back. So the Luddites normally has been seen as people that are afraid for technology and, and opposed to technology. It's, that's not the story. It's not a historic story. Luddites were against the exploitation of men and women by technology. That's a big difference. The Luddites themselves were also technology driven. But and I think this is the position that I really embrace. We're, I'm not against technology. I love it. My whole organization loves it. We have a fab lab and a bio lab and we we, 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 we tinker every day. It's nice to do it. So you can embrace it, but you have to always think about what, is, what, what kind of power structures are underneath the surface. And um, so, yes, we have, to be, we have to be very critical about AI, how it, how it works now. It's a huge danger, but it goes in the, right, the wrong hands. So if we would sort of rethink how would we devi develop AI, generative AI, any of them, uh, using the public stack uh, principles, they wouldn't, that would not score on any of these four principles. That would be a negative, because it's extractive, it's monopoly, it's uh, there is no public values, there is no human rights inside. It's any none of those have been taken into account. If you would do that, if you would start to use these kind of principles and then start to think about AI, you could make something that could work for also for society. The 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 the, the, the 
direction that we have now is really, really terrible. But I want to uh, sort of uh, uh, end on a positive note, because I think it is possible. So I can do the, the recapitulation again, and I could sort of say, well, at the end, the third step was then now big tech is in control, and we are out of control, society, our strategic autonomy is at risk, our privacy is at risk, all these kind of things are at risk. But because we are here together, and we have also power in the public sphere and in the civic sphere, we can change it. Because of new legislation, as I already referred to, the, the Digital Service Act, most of these new acts are really important, not sufficient. They're only the first steps. Uh, but I embrace them because they're definitely something that can change the whole landscape of technology. It can bring some of the rights back, consumer rights, for example. Human rights is not so much at the table, but consumer rights is what is now uh, at the table, which is not enough, but it's something. Um, we can put it in procurement. So with the public stack, we are, as, as VAG, we are involved in working together with uh, education institutions, with uh, cultural institutions, to, to, to apply this kind of in energy transition, the technology that we use in the energy, energy transition, to make them public stack based, which is a really something that you can apply. You don't have, it's not very theoretical. It's, in the end, it's, it's very, very straightforward. Um, yeah, so with determination, design, an active approach, I think we can find the solutions for, for the problems that we have uh, at hand. Uh, and luckily, there are more and more examples for that. So you can, you can get rid of Google Docs, use uh, Nextcloud. You can get rid of WhatsApp, use Signal. You can go to ProtonMail instead of the... So there's a lot of alternatives. And I think more and more people start to use it or say in their own organization, like in, for example, in, polit in, in, in bureaucracies, uh, that you're not allowed to use WhatsApp anymore. You have to use Signal. So there's, there's really steps that you can make, very simple steps with applications that are already public value based. If you didn't have enough from this conference, <laughs> there's another conference <laughs> that I want to invite to you, which is the Public Spaces Conference. And actually, it's, it's, it's all for this collective. It, it, is, it is the same topic, I think, with cultural institutions, museums, also archives that come together, uh, together also with people from politics and other organizations, social movements, and so on. I think there is some, some moment in time now that we can act upon, and I hope you all join us in that. Thank you so much. Yeah, we, we could sit. Yeah, or maybe maybe, maybe stand because we, we we I'm pretty sure they have some we have some questions from the audience. But thank you, Marlene. This this was really inspiring. So, so before I open the floor for for questions from the audience, I, I have two myself actually. Um, and and so you gave this wonderful iceberg illustration, right, of, of the public stack. And then you said we also we really make this concrete. That's 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 what I what I like, right? Also in my introduction. And you said, well, we're working, for example, with education or other organizations. Could you tell a bit more about this? How, how do you make this this fantastic theoretical public stack concrete? Yeah, this this one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, in different ways. I mean, it, it partly it's 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 awareness. Of course, it starts with awareness and also telling another story. The book that you showed about the internet is broken, but we can fix it. Yeah. I realized that in order to to also convince myself that we can fix it, because I, I was of course was in doubt. Like, can we really fix it? Um, I'm not naive about the powers that be. Um, I realized that I had to go back to where where the origins come from, and I realized we have to need we need another narrative. Because if we stick to the nerve that we that we can have the internet because of Google, people don't even uh, can imagine that it can be different. So it, partly it starts with telling the other story, telling the story, and 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 I think we all need you for that also for for that part which is un not uncovered yet, which we don't know yet. So there's a lot of other stuff that you have to do as well, but that part really needs um, storytelling, research, and archive, and 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 also bringing to life archives, which is, and that is also a problem with the digital city, it's more than just having it, it's also showing it and being able to present it and to share it. So it starts with the storytelling. Then the second part is really to understand the problem. And people have to go deeper into the technology because people tend to say, well, this is not for me, I don't understand it. I, I sort of outsource it to people. But we can't do that because technology is a cultural artifact. So even if you're not a techie, 
You have to be involved. And also a techie is always has a cultural background. So it, there has a bias. So this is a really a shared environment. So change the way that we develop technology, bringing other people on the table. But you also have to you have to understand what a protocol is, for example. Uh, a, a, DP, to, to a, 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 a distributed protocol is something else than a centralized protocol. It's very easy to, 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 to understand that, actually. It's not so, it's not, it's not uh, yeah, rocket science. It's much easier to get into some of the of the knowledge, and I guess you, you because you deal with a lot of of the digital, maybe you already made this, those steps. But in society, this is really important because really people think like I don't want to know it. And the third step is to really go into action, which means that you have to uh, make this make make it actionable. Which means that you uh, put your money where your mouth is. So starting, uh, for example. Starting to become part of the Fediverse is actually I'm now I started in '94 by being moderating already then um, a digital use, use, use uh, discussion groups and I, I have been in court for all kind of stuff which are the same problems we have still now 30 years later and now I'm moderating um, uh, the Mastodon server again so I feel like what what happened why am I back? why am I back but I think it's important that understanding that moderation, you can't outsource moderation to, to, to Elon Musk or to somebody else. Outside. We have to face it ourselves. So part of what we need is to develop our social skills. We, can, we can't just make big tech responsible for that. So in every country, in every society, in any community has to, to build their own knowledge and their capabilities there. But it's also like, well, like with the fair phone. Start, start, if you think we need a fair phone, start to make it start to build the company to do that. So the research was in the Waag, but Fairphone became a separate company, which then had its own endeavor to make it. I mean, this has been a huge thing to do. And we see all around us, and then support the ones that are doing it. And maybe lastly, which is very interesting to work with, for example, the host of Amsterdam, the Applied Science of Amsterdam, to talk with the board, really with the with the the the, the, the chair, and so to, to make them aware that they have responsibilities towards their students, towards their own professionals, and they can make a difference if they start to collaborate with others. So in the in the Netherlands, we have now Surfnet as the collaborative. Uh, for the rest of the university to collaborate. Mm -hmm. And with public spaces, we collaborate with all the cultural institutions. Also with the broadcasters. So so it, that, that kind of stuff is also yeah bringing people together, working on it. Okay, nice. So doing stuff. Now these, this community is archiving the web. Uh, and you pointed out to the, to the Vediverse, right? And, and the Mastodon server that Waag is hosting. And in the Netherlands, all, well, over, all over the world, all sorts of instances. What would you recommend to this community about the future of web archiving if you see this Fediverse getting bigger? Is it getting bigger? And, and if so, what would, what would we as a web archiving community should do to that? Well, first of all, um, for, as, far, as far as you don't do it, participate. Start your community there. Uh, because then you're building, you're part of the movement to change instead, of, yeah, so I think that makes sense. A lot of, actually, a lot of research is being moved from. A lot of the communities around research have moved to 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 uh, to to the Fediverse and to Mastodon and other for version. Mastodon is not the only Fediverse application there anymore. Um, so that that is first and get a little bit acquainted with it. But I think um, it's definitely will grow. Um, this is the moment to step. Now you're first. Now you're there. You can be instead of 20 years later, trying to figure out what happened and trying to, like like a freeze of 1996, trying to get it working, you're, you're there now. You, you're, you have the tools and the position to do it. Hopefully, the position. I mean, you have the, f the funding and the money to do it. But you can start right now, which is much better than being later in the game. Do something. Yeah, act. Okay, Start act, up. act, nice. Okay, let's act. Uh, I always wanted to do this. I know all the chairs uh, wanted to do this, <laughs> toss this thing through your head. So are there any questions for Marlene's remarks, thoughts? Oh, that's close by. Okay, hold on. No, 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 no. Dive. <laughs> Here you go. Oh, yeah, excellent. <laughs> okay, uh, yes, thank you Marlene for your wonderful talk. I really like that you used uh, historical research, but also then a combination with the future. Um, I had a question whether or whether you have an example um, of the Waag Future Lab um, 
if you have you actively looked at uh, less dominant narratives and how those have informed the current projects you are working on? L less known narratives. Yes, and whether you whether at the WAG you actually do historical research and how that informs the current projects that the lab is doing. Uh, yeah, I, th I think in, in the 30 years of, of stories that, and work that we have done, there are many stories that we would like to talk, to tell, but we also <laughs> we also have an attic with all this stuff on it, and we also have, need the time to do this. Uh, and one of my, I think one of the interesting things that I would love to do, and sometimes we we can start to do a little bit of it, is about our, um, um, innovation biographies to understand how something came into being. Because mostly it, is, it, it repeats itself. So somebody presents something as an innovation, but then because I, I am there already for 30 years, I know that I already knew it had happened before. But it's not, it, it has not been described. So somebody else takes the, takes the, the, what is it, the, the gain or the, uh, and it's not, it's not that they should not do it. I'm just saying I, was, I would love to shine the light on the people that did it first and see how they other people built upon what other people did. So uh, there are many of those little stories. For, for example, in we have this beautiful project, Real Time Amsterdam. It's made by, an, uh, by us in combination with an artist, Esther Porlock. It was the first time that we did real time um, with, a, with, mo with mobile. So there was, there was a, a, a digital assistant because there was no iPhone yet and a GPS. And then we draw the city of Amsterdam real time. Uh, later this became applications and people s said they were doing this as their innovation, but I know it started with people like Esther Pollock, who came from a totally different background. So yes, I would love to have those stories better told and I wish I, I myself or other people could collaborate on it. Okay. So especially where artists have been part of the innovation cycle. Yes. That's you. actually also I think why you also first look back right to understand where we're right now and where yeah because uh, what what the problem for me with maybe that's of course around innovation there is this strange story that you have to be very young uh that you have to be male of course that you have to be entrepreneurial and, and techie and that together makes you the best uh breaking innovative force this is like the this the, this is the model and there's so many different other people that are really important. So, uh, uh, for example, at the moment, the really big names in AI are not um, the people from Google and from, from it's uh, Timni Gebru, uh, it's uh, Emily Bender. They're women. They're, they're always excluded from the story of, 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 of uh, um, Ada Lovelight. So they're always being excluded from the stories. And only later, you know, you finally you find it back that they were actually the designers of it, or, or, or have been part of the design, or have, been, have taken a role. So yeah, we, we tend to have very shallow stories, and we really have to enrich them in order to feel more people feel included in the process instead of only being excluded. Thank you. Any further questions? Oh, all the way there. Okay, so you first have to toss it, I think, three lines up, and then <laughs> somebody has to catch it, and then, yeah, you can do this. Come on, it's Friday Whoa. afternoon. We didn't have drinks yet. Here you go. Yeah, there we go. There is yeah. actually uh, for, for for people uh, while we're doing yeah. this. There is a two more up. <laughs> go on. <laughs> there is a public is stack <laughs> website <laughs> with some tooling as well. So if you are interested, it's 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 connected to our waag.org website. You can find public stack website with a lot of tooling around it and and, and examples. Yeah. Hi, uh, Marlene. Very uh, much. Hi. hi. Um, <laughs> Um, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Um, I really like the quotes uh, that you brought from the New York Times about the Luddites and um, the different uh, processes that you uh, brought to light and uh, different dimensions that uh, people designing AIs uh, should take into account. And I was wondering what your opinion was about uh, open models that uh, like the stable LM uh, trained by stability AI, for example, where they're trying to do all the same things, like steal all the data, it's like read it and everything appropriate, but put a model in a, in the public sphere so anyone can use it. Yeah. Um, yes, it, of, of course, I've been I've been one of the people that were always up for open data and, and open hardware and open software and so on, or free software. Um, I now tend to call it more data commons or public code or public data because I think 
in, in the term open, we don't protect it enough. So uh, I think open should be, uh, I think it should be open, but there should be rules. Who can use it? And, and, and so that you have a certain form of protection. Uh, so the whole movement around data commons is something that we are very working on a lot. Uh, in different fields, in mobility, in energy, but also in in in, in the social sphere, or, uh, but also anybody who works on open. I think an algorithm should not be closed. It's a rule, and it should have you, you have to assess it. So, so a lot of so open is really uh, defining, but uh, is but open with a governance. Uh, so, uh, like open access, the, the whole movement. I ha sometimes have a troll visit because it feels as if you sort of open the the tap for anybody, uh, and then also people that have the wrong intentions can tap your what you have publicly funded. Uh, so I think this this type of uh, governing and and so the term public at, at this moment <coughs> uh, is sometimes better for me because it implies that you have to think about the governance and not just GitHub or just. But yes, anybody who works on that to me has my uh, admiration. <laughs> But does it also refer to your, your comment about the Creative Commons license that you have on your website? That you yes, yeah, so the Creative Commons is, of course has been a very important movement. A lot of people have um, embraced it, but now um, uh, that's why I think that, that, that there is a, but to start a, a lawsuit against mm -hmm. whoever, you know, it's sometimes strange, but it's, but actually this, I think there will be a lot of IP people being first, <laughs> but, get, but they really feel that they're infringed. A lot of a lot of the the chat GPT stuff and all the others use IP protected yeah. content, yeah. but also Creative Commons content. So even the stuff that wants to be public but not being pri uh, privatized is in it. So it's really it's really problematic. Yeah. Okay, time for one last question, final question. If not, um, then I want to ask you all to give a big hand of applause for for Marlene. Marlene, thank you so much. <laughs>